Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out in the cold today to attend today's occasional lecture. And uh, I hope we have in store a great treat for you because at least it will be taking our minds off our own situation uh, and turning our minds to uh, the uh, political system in another country. We're very pleased today to be able to bring you distinguished professor Kenneth Mayer from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I should say at the outset that we are very grateful to the uh, Embassy of the United States of America for sharing Professor Mayer with us. He is on a speaking tour of Australia at the moment. And in fact, he's just about to conclude his speaking tour. And that tour has been sponsored by the US Embassy. So I do convey our thanks to the Embassy for sponsoring uh, the visit and for allowing us to share in uh, today's uh, proceedings. Professor Mayer has a distinguished career in academia as a researcher, writer, teacher, and his areas of interest include the US political system and its institutions, particularly the office of the president, presidential powers. Uh, he's also very well written and researched in areas like campaign finance. Uh, electoral law, which is of great interest to us, and also uh, very significant issues such as defence procurement. And as well, there is more, he has a, a long-standing interest in Australian polit politics and our political system. And uh, in 2006, he was the inaugural Fulbright ANU Distinguished Chair in American Political Science at the Australian National University. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Kenneth Mayer. Thank you. So thank you for uh, taking the time to come out. I am delighted to be here. Uh, this is my third trip to Australia. Uh, my family and I spent six months here in 2006. Uh, I returned in November 2007 to observe the parliamentary elections and I hope I've been trying to convince my wife to move here. She's not having any of it because it's a little far away. Uh, but when my kids who were in uh, high school and primary school when they were here, now they're in college and high school, when they found out I was returning, uh, my son who studies engineering at the University of Wisconsin <coughs> indicated that he wants to do an exchange, uh, spend a year studying here and my 15 year old daughter uh, says that she is uh, adamant that she will marry an Australian. <laughs> so uh, we may, if they follow through on that and move here, we'll have to move here. Uh, uh, I have always enjoyed coming here. Uh, I learn something every time, spent a lot of time studying the Australian political system. And on this trip, I learned something very significant, is that I have discovered a scientific cure for jet lag that occurs when you fly from the United States to Australia, which was debilitating in my first two trips. Uh, this is guaranteed to work, and the, it's actually quite simple. All you have to do is fly business class on somebody else's dime. Uh, it, it works like, like a charm. So uh, what I will be talking about today is uh, our presidential election, but talking about it in a more general sense, not just specifically about the presidential election, but the more general problem <coughs> of making forecasts of uh, what, is, what is likely to happen in the, when the general election is held in November 2012. So I'll pose the question, say uh, some comments about uh, the forecasting problem itself, uh, talk specifically about the different models of forecasting presidential elections that have been developed through social science and, and other kinds of efforts, and then talk about the implications of these models to come up with a, a, a forecast of what uh, is going to happen in, uh, in November. So the question can be put very simply, who will win the presidential election in November 2012? Uh, and like my discovery of jet lag, I have an absolute scientific answer to this question, which is nobody knows. Uh, and the reason nobody knows is that it hasn't happened yet, and that our ability to predict events that occur in the future is actually uh, limited for reasons that, uh, are, that make quite a bit of sense if you think about them. 
Now, despite the fact that it, it's not possible to make predictions with certainty about uh, what is going to happen in November, it is possible to express boundaries about what is uh, uh, the most unlikely or the most unlikely. Uh, so one conditional probability that we can make is that the possibility that it will be Sarah Palin approaches zero because she's not a candidate. That tells you a lot. Another conditional probability that we can express that if Sarah Palin is elected that something really bad has happened <laughs> also approaches one because that would require a kind of significant disruption that would be uh, 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 enormously traumatic to if anybody but Romney or Obama is elected. And my, my uh, advice, I guess I, I don't suppose I would get into trouble for giving investment advice, uh, which I'm not qualified to do, but if it looks like someone other than Barack Obama or Mitt Romney is going to be elected president in November, my advice is to buy as much gold as possible. Uh, but this is what we really want to know. Uh, given the fact that we know that Barack Obama and Mitt Romney will be the Democratic and Republican candidates, who will win? And if uh, 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 there is also the, the, the deeper question of uh, how much, uh, by how much will they win? What, what will the percentage of the popular vote likely be? What will the Electoral College vote count be? What the implications would be for arguments about the legitimacy or mandate that the winning candidate will receive. So given that it hasn't happened yet, we are a little more than five months away, we have to make a forecast. And I'm going to get sort of social science here for a minute, but these, uh, uh, these definitions actually will make some sense. A forecast or a prediction about something that happens in the future uh, is really a, a conditional statement, uh, meaning that it, that based on what happens between now and then, much of which we don't know, we can make some predictions about likely or unlikely events uh, in the future, but the, the key feature of a forecast, of, of, a, of an accurate forecast as opposed to a uh, 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 claim of psychic powers and really being able to, to divine the future, we can only make forecasts based on the information that we have at any point in time. So we don't know what's going to happen in August. We do have information that we can observe today. And the problem then becomes one of, of using this information to make the best, most accurate prediction which we can express with the most confidence of what will happen in the future. So let's parse this a little bit, what that means. Conditional means that these predictions are uncertain. Uh, they might happen, they might not. Certain events are more likely than others, but uh, any time that uh, uh, you see a forecast expressed in terms of certainty, uh, that is by itself a good sign that something fishy is going on because uh, anybody who, who makes a claim about what they know will happen in the future uh, at this far in advance is really lucky because uh, uh, given enough people making predictions, it's possible that, that someone is going to hit the bullseye just because if there are enough people making predictions that you're likely to see that. The information uh, that we have is our knowledge about particular events or things that we can measure, how the economy is doing, uh, what the public opinion is about the candidates, uh, what presidential approval is, and we can use that information to relate it to previous outcomes and, and put the independent and dependent variables together which we use our models to do. For example, one of the models I will describe that's very commonly used in the United States is to make forecasts about elections, presidential elections, based on economic growth and presidential popularity six months before the election. And we can observe what has happened in the past, uh, previous presidents, their popularity, economic growth. We have good reasons to, to think of uh, a why those two things ought to be related to how an incumbent president performs, and as our models get better and more sophisticated, our predictions uh, will become more accurate. And it is also an invariable feature of forecasts that the, far, the, the farther into the future we are attempting to make our forecasts, 
the more uncertain they become because there are, there are just as a function of time, there are more things that can happen between the point at which we make the forecast and the election. So you will, I will show you that if you try to make a prediction of what's going to happen in the presidential election two days before the election, those predictions actually are fairly, actually not fairly accurate, they tend to be very accurate because there's not a lot that can happen, things have been set, but that's not really interesting. What we want to know is what's going to happen six months from now. So let me give you some examples. It turns out that, that we use, for, we do forecasts all the time in our daily life. Even if we don't think of them as actual forecasts, we do. And some, most of the time, it's just an intuitive kind of prediction about what will happen. Uh, and these can range from very, very simple forecasts to uh, assessments that, that uh, are far more complicated and uncertain. So one of the, the big thing that uh, virtually everybody wants to know is how investments are going to do. Uh, whether you're buying real estate or stocks or bonds, you want to make a prediction about what's going to happen to those investments a year, five years, ten years, and uh, this turns out to be very, very difficult to do because there's a strong random component. But to the extent that someone is able to make these kinds of forecasts accurately, the payoffs can be enormous. If, if someone is able to uh, construct a model that can predict with some accuracy how the stock market or real estate prices uh, will do. The, uh, the benefit is that you become fabulously wealthy if you are correct. And the reason more people don't do this is that it's actually quite difficult. Traffic routes, when you are getting ready to go to work in the morning, what do you think the probabilities are of an accident or heavy traffic or some type of traffic jam and you adjust your routes uh, accordingly. How long is it going to take to get to work? And this is something that we do every day. Where to buy a house? I have a quest uh, an exclamation point here because in the United States this actually turned out to be a very risky forecast. People who bought houses in 2005 or 2006 when real estate prices had reached their peak, which we now know was a bubble. It's, it's uh, uh, millions of people bought houses only to see the prices drop dramatically over the next three or four years. And so for a long time, buying a house was viewed as virtually a risk-free investment that would always go up in value. Uh, that's no longer true. Whether to plan an outdoor wedding. Uh, is it going to rain? Now, if you're trying to plan an outdoor wedding three days in advance, you actually have very good information about the, what the weather is going to, going to be. If you're planning a wedding a year in advance and you're trying to figure out whether, I don't know when the rainy season here, but I guess if you were in Darwin, it would be foolish to plan an outdoor wedding in January. Uh, but you, you try to make forecasts and that can be very difficult to do. Uh, and then when we do all the time is when we're in the grocery store, we try to predict which checkout line will move the fastest. And the interesting feature about this forecast is that it is always wrong. <laughs> um, so we do make forecasts. It, we can also make statements about conditions or things that are inherently difficult to predict. Uh, uh, for example, the next number produced by a true random process, such as lottery numbers. In the US, it's very common. Uh, they use a variety of physical uh, processes to, to produce random numbers, and in, in an ideal random process, there is zero relationship between the number that is picked now and the number that will be picked next. And I don't know whether they do this in casinos in Australia, but in the United States it's quite common that roulette is an example of something that is very, very close to a true random process where you cannot predict what the next number will be based on the numbers that have come up recently. But in the United States, there was, you will always see a display that lists the previous 10 or 15 numbers. And so, you know, uh, 27 black, 26 red, 14. And so people instinctively think, well, if five black numbers or five red numbers have come up in a row, that means that the next number is likely to be the, the opposite. And it's very, it's very intuitive. Of course, it's wrong because these are independent events. So there are lots of uh, biases that creep in as we think about our own ability to predict. Chaotic systems, nonlinear systems, in which infinitesimally small differences in the initial conditions can, over time, lead to gigantic differences in the outcomes. 
for example, long-range weather, that our ability to predict weather a few days or a week into the future is actually pretty good. Our ability to predict weather six months, a year, or climate change models, which attempt to forecast what's going to happen 10 or 20 years, it turns out to be very, very difficult. Tornado paths, in which you know, trying to figure out when a tornado will form, where it will touch down, and the path that it will take turns out to be impossible. And we, well, not impossible because we know certain areas have weather patterns that are more likely to produce tornadoes than others, but knowing precisely where a tornado will touch down, what the path it will, uh, uh, it will take is much less possible. Events that occur so infrequently that it is simply not easy or not possible to predict with any kind of confidence when or where they might occur. For example, commercial airline crashes that given enough time and enough airline uh, trips, I, sh I should be careful here because I'm getting on three planes in the next two days, uh, but I convinced myself that uh, I'm more likely to get hit by a bus in the middle of Parliament House than to die in a plane crash, but there it is. Very difficult to predict, and when the Concorde uh, had its only fatal accident, it was about, I think it was about 10 years ago when it took off and a, a piece of metal that had dropped off of a previous plane was kicked up and damaged the engine, it was the only fatal crash that Concorde had ever had in 20 years of service but it was considered such a vulnerability when it was discovered that it grounded the entire fleet permanently. Uh, terrorist attacks, another example of things that occur uh, with such low probability, particularly in, the, in, in the, the Western world, that it's very difficult to predict uh, when or where they will occur. And there are also phenomena that we simply don't have sufficient understanding of to make any kind of confident predictions about what will happen less, not what will happen next. Earthquakes, for example, that scientists have been devoting enormous time over the last 30 to 40 years trying to come up with models that can tell us where the next earthquake will occur, and again, we can identify the places that are most likely along fault lines and so forth, but when they will occur is much more difficult, and it's simply because we lack an understanding of these phenomena that's sufficient to give us the ability to figure out why they happen, when they happen. Another example would be the Kardashians. Uh, and uh, I, in Australia, I'm also told I have to make reference to Shane Warne of a poorly understood phenomena that's impossible to predict. <laughs> so, reasons why forecasting is difficult. Uh, the first is our models might simply not be good enough to give us sufficient understanding of what's going to happen. There may be things that we don't know that we understand if they occur will have an effect on our predictions. Presidential election, uh, it is very plausible to think, in fact, it's true that what happens with economic growth over the next few months will have a significant effect on the outcome, but we don't know what the uh, figures for growth and real gross domestic product will be. The figures, the, the second quarter ends in a little over a month, and we know this will have an effect, but we don't know what it will actually what it will actually be. So there are future random shocks, things that could happen, they may not happen. If they do, they will have an effect. If they don't, they won't have an effect, but we don't know what, what those might be. Uh, and the conditions on the ground can change in unpredictable ways. It's also the case that there may be things that we don't know that we don't know. And engineers use this kind of terminology all the time. There are certain things that you understand will have an effect on your ability to construct a, a particular piece of equipment or using technology, but in many other cases, things arise that you can't predict because you, you don't know what you, what you don't know. So let's take this back to November of 2012. So in trying to make forecasts about what is likely to happen, we can group the forecasting models into a number of different categories. We can look at trial heats public opinion polls. If the election were held today, who would you vote for? And for a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about, these tend to be extremely unreliable, particularly this, this far out, although they also have the characteristic that as you get closer to the election, they become much more accurate. We can look at quantitative models, statistical models that relate economic performance, uh, six months, a year in advance perhaps, to how an incumbent might do. 
We can also look at how popular an incumbent is uh, at a particular point in time and make predictions based on what has happened in the past to presidents at that level of popularity, those that might be, have been more or less popular. We can use expert methods, which being academics, we like to attach scientific terms to these models. One of them is the Delphi method. Uh, which was very popular in the 60s, and basically it means that you surveyed experts about what they think would happen. Uh, before I came to the University of Wisconsin, uh, I worked for the RAND Corporation, which is a consulting firm uh, in the U.S., and everybody at RAND talked about the Bogsart model. You know, the Bogsart model says this, the Bogsart model said that, and I had, didn't have any idea what this meant, and I heard it all the time. Finally, I asked my boss, you know, what is the Bogsart model mean? He says, oh, that's an acronym, stands for a bunch of guys sitting around a table. Uh, and we have the, the kind of model that I prefer, which uh, I will call market-based models. Uh, and I think these are, uh, have a lot of advantages over some of these other models, but I want to walk through, uh, walk through them and talk about their uh, pluses and minuses. So one of the reasons that trial heats are unreliable is they are hugely volatile and they can change in ways that are extremely unpredictable. So what this chart shows the results of Gallup Corporation or the Gallup polling company, their trial heat of when, if the election were held today, who would you vote for, Obama or Romney? And you can see that a month ago, in, in April, Obama had a huge lead. Uh, uh, as many as, well, I guess this is not a 100-point scale, it ranges from 30 to 52, but uh, Obama was up by as much as 6 to 8 percentage points, which would be a fairly safe, uh, fairly safe advantage for, for any candidate. But you can see between, uh, in the last week or so of April, that it closed up considerably. Why did it close up considerably? Well, voters, there were more voters paying attention. Uh, uh, Romney locked up the Republican nomination. There were a lot of things that, that, can, that can change or did change, uh, and the numbers have bounced around with both Romney and Obama. Sometimes one has a lead, sometimes the other has a lead, but a, a, a difference of one or two percentage points is within the margin of error of any of these polls. So it's basically Obama went from uh, a huge lead uh, to basically a statistical tie in the space of about 10 days. And that doesn't mean that these numbers are incorrect. What it means is that they can change so quickly that knowing what the numbers show today don't really tell you much about what's going to happen, what they might show in a week or two weeks or five or six months. Uh, now, you could also look at these numbers and say, well, the fact that Obama is an incumbent and that uh, only, only once in the last uh, month or so did he actually even get close to 50% and think, well, that's, that's a bad sign for an incumbent because one of the rules of thumb that, uh, that we use is, to, is if an incumbent cannot break the 50% threshold, that's a danger sign because Obama has been in office for three and a half years. Voters uh, have been exposed to a lot of what he has done. There's a record there. People are familiar with him. Uh, presumably, there are not that many people who are undecided about Obama. With Romney, it makes more sense that his numbers don't break above 50 percent because most people haven't paid attention to, uh, to politics yet, and there's quite a bit of, uh, of rational ignorance when it comes to thinking about politics in the general public. One sign that most of the public uh, is relatively inattentive to politics and political information. Uh, public opinion polls for the last 30 years have shown repeatedly that if you ask a random sample of Americans which party has a majority in the House of Representatives, usually you will get between 50 and 55 percent of people giving you the right answer. There are only two possibilities. So even if people flipped a coin and or randomly responded, you would actually expect to get numbers in that range. Uh, we can break this down a little bit. This is also from Gallup, looking at presidential vote preferences in swing states, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and so forth. These are states that are 
considered competitive as opposed to California, which is almost always uh, reliably Democratic, Texas, which is almost always reliably Republican. There's not much doubt as to what's going to happen there. So we can also look at uh, how the candidates do in trial heats in uh, these swing states, and you see basically the same thing, that Obama uh, a month ago was up by uh, nine percentage points. Now again, he's up by two. That is again uh, very likely to be a statistical tie. But the problem with these models is that they, they can change in ways that are that are unpredictable, and that knowing what, what is happening now simply doesn't tell us uh, much of anything about what's going to happen a month, two months, four months from now. This is a, uh, uh, taken from an academic article that looks at the accuracy of the trial heat percentages, uh, who the candidate, who the public says they're going to vote for, the, the correlation or the strength of the relationship between the percentages at any point in time with the final percentages expressed uh, here, the, uh, the uh, x-axis is the number of days before the election, going up to about a year, uh, and then going to uh, just before the election. And you can see very clearly that these numbers get better as you get closer to the election. And it makes a lot of sense, but it also means that six months out, uh, the relationship is actually less, th it, it actually works out to be less than random. Uh, well, not quite, because we're not making a prediction of who wins. We're making a prediction about what the vote percentage will be. But the numbers this far in advance are simply not very accurate in trying to assess what's going to happen. So trial heats are interesting. It's a parlor game, but the, there, we, we, we need to have better ways of doing this. Well, we can also look at models of presidential popularity. This is, again, from Gallup, looking at the incumbent's approval rating. Uh, do you approve or disapprove of the job Barack Obama is doing as president? In the, the popularity in the, in the year before, one year before the election, and uh, what happens at the election. For Obama, this popularity rating a year before the election was actually quite low. It was in the low 40s. And you can see that the, uh, the lowest approval rating for a candidate who won one year before the election was Richard Nixon at 49% in 1972. Uh, going back all the way to the 1944 election, which was really the first time that these techniques had been worked out with sufficient accuracy to allow us to make good predictions, uh, Barack Obama's approval rating was about six percentage points lower than this. This would say it's never happened. Uh, he's going to lose. But again, this suffers from the same problem as the, uh, as the trial heats. This is like, this is something that never happens until it happens. And then you have to revise your model. So this is, again, interesting. And you can also look at, can at candidates. Uh, George Bush, his popularity rating was 59% in, 1990, uh, in November 1991. Uh, he wound up losing, uh, so even being more popular is uh, no guarantee. Well, what about quantitative models? Let's, let's apply the techniques of statistical inference. We can look at a wide range of data, economic data, public approval data, and look at those, how, those, uh, how that data gives us a sense of what's going to happen six months into the future. Uh, there's an economist at Yale named Ray Fair, who is really one of the most well-known proponents of these models, that he looks at the, the percentage for the, the percentage of the two-party vote for the incumbent based on uh, economic performance and, well, that's actually it, just solely as a function of economic performance. There's another model that is used by the, uh, the polling, polling firm started by Helmut Norputh, which looks at economic performance, primary results, and there are other models that academics use that factor in incumbent popularity six months in advance, and these turn out to be reasonably accurate uh, in telling us what's likely to happen. These also suggest a, a rough road for Obama, and in large part because uh, the economy in the U.S. is, we are technically not in recession, but economic growth is, is anemic. It's running in the 1.5% to 2%, 1.9%, not nearly enough to uh, recover from the significant job losses that occurred between 
2008 and roughly 2010, early 2011. When you combine that with economic, with the uh, popularity, these would suggest that Obama is going to have uh, a significant problem. The advantages of these models is, is that because they are, they, they have a, the, the desirable character that they, we can make predictions that have confidence intervals. We can say that this is our best guess, that the two-party vote will be 51 percent, and that the, uh, the property of these, uh, uh, of these inferences suggests that they are extremely unlikely to be more than a percentage or a percentage and a half uh, away, and, and that, that's actually a very useful phenomenon for these. We can make the predictions well in advance, six months, a year in advance. They tend to be accurate, but they also have some significant problems. They completely ignore candidates and campaigns. They simply assume that everything is determined by these variables six months, a year in advance. And even though they tend to be reasonably accurate, we also know that campaigns do matter and that it is probably a mistake to assume uh, a level of determinism that suggests that these things are, uh, that the campaigns simply do not matter. They cannot deal with third parties. Uh, they can only accurately estimate or even somewhat accurately with all the problems. They, they do not deal well with third parties. And third parties are generally not a major factor in American presidential elections. They can be in 1992. Ross Perot got almost 20 percent of the vote. Uh, but even when they are not significant, in 2000, Ralph Nader got 1%, less than 1% of the vote, but he also got 90,000 votes in Florida, where George Bush, as the result of a controversial series of decisions, was declared the winner uh, with a margin of 537 votes. Uh, and all of the statistical models suggested that the Democrats would win easily. Al Gore, in fact, won the popular vote, uh, but lost Florida and hence the presidency, because that gave George Bush uh, uh, a 271 vote, uh, 271 votes in the Electoral College. But if Nader was not on the ballot, even though he received a trivial number of votes, uh, in turn, one and a half percent in Florida, it was enough of those 90,000 people. If Nader was not on the ballot, most of them would have voted for Al Gore. Not all of them, but if Nader's on the not on the ballot, our best model suggests that Gore wins Florida by tens of thousands of votes. And so that makes these uh, less useful when that's a possibility. And by ignoring the campaigns and the candidates, we know that those make a difference. And it seems to be uh, a problem if you use a model which, by assumption, waves those things away. Well, now we can talk about market-based expert methods. Economists have long known that crowds know things that individuals can't uh, or don't know. Uh, and depending on the size of the crowd, crowds can uh, know things in the aggregate that encompass far more information than any individual or small group of individuals could possibly know. This is one of the arguments for why market economies are, are always more efficient than centrally planned economies, because the essence of a market is lots and lots of individuals in the classic uh, uh, economic perfect, uh, uh, perfect market. You have an infinite number of buyers, an infinite number of sellers, and an infinite number of possible combinations, and that allows for the efficient utilization of resources that makes everybody best off, and there's no way that even the most well-informed central planner can incorporate that much information. Uh, we don't even know, have to know how this works. And there's a wonderful book by an economist named James Surowiecki called The Wisdom of Crowds, where he got interested in this by noting a phenomenon that economists have known about for years, that it's, it's, a, it's a very common, it had been a very common game in state fairs in the United States to, to display a steer or a cow and have people guess the weight of that animal. And as an individual looks at that, you know, the, the animal could weigh 1,200 pounds, 2,600 pounds, maybe more. An individual is actually unlikely to be exactly right. But if the number of people who make guesses is large enough, it turns out that the average of all of those guesses is almost always extremely close to the actual weight of the animal. And 
how is that? How could you have no one person be right or close, but the, or not many people be close, but the average of a large number of guesses turns out to be uh, frequently very, very accurate. And the reason is that individuals making estimates will often produce better forecasts than even the most well-informed individual. And that's in part because when people are, there are a couple of things that have to happen uh, for this to occur. The, uh, you have to have a large number of individuals. The, the guesses have to be unrelated, so the biases and errors will even out. And the reason this works is that you have a lot of people making guesses, maybe not even using the same method, uh, but if you have enough people using enough different methods, it turns out that they will average out to be roughly correct because they are independent. People will, uh, in markets, one of the reasons they tend to be very efficient is that people uh, continually update their beliefs. So if anybody is familiar with the efficient market hypothesis for stock market uh, uh, investing, you know, the idea is that whatever information is known is instantly incorporated into people's assessments of the price of a commodity, a stock, or something. So once you hear a hot tip at a, at a cocktail uh, party about you should invest in this, uh, 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 you should buy Facebook, you should sell Facebook, by the time you hear that, it's too late because if, if you know, you, and, and there's a wonderful story of, uh, I think it was either Andrew Carnegie or J.P. Morgan, who actually uh, sold all of his holdings uh, shortly before the stock market crash in, 2000, in 1929. And we, he was asked how he did it. He said, well, when I heard my shoeshine boy making stock market uh, predictions, I knew it was time to get out. Uh, and uh, the idea is that people will instantly incorporate all of the available information into their opinions. And this, this is what a market is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a concentrated, specialized, narrow form of a market, but it relies on the same me mechanism, which is Adam Smith's invisible hand. We don't even need to know how people make these estimates. We just know that people will use different methods and that in the aggregate they will tend to be accurate. If you add to that the possibility, or in the sense of a market, that people have their, their own skin in the game, they have their own money invested in this, that gives them an even greater incentive to be efficient and informed and careful. So the University of Iowa Business School actually runs something called the Iowa Electronic Markets. If you Google it, you'll be able to get there in one or two steps. And they started this about 20 years ago, and it's actually a futures market in which people can buy and sell shares in candidates, presidential candidates. And the feature of this market, which actually, uh, as a futures market, it would normally be regulated by the federal government through the agency that regulates these things called the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, but they are exempt from those regulations because you can only invest up to $500. Uh, you can't invest uh, unlimited amounts of money. Uh, and because it's a research-oriented enterprise, they do not have to uh, abide by all of the disclosure and control mechanisms that a, a true futures market uh, has, to, uh, has to abide by. But the idea behind the IEM is that you can buy and sell shares in candidates. If the candidate wins the election, that sh each share pays off at a price of $1. If your candidate loses, it pays off zero. You lose everything. And so whatever the price of a share is for a candidate at any point in time is exactly equivalent to the estimated probability in the market that that candidate will win. So a 50 percent, uh, if shares are selling for 50 cents, uh, you know that the candidate has a 50% chance of winning. If, as it goes up or down, the prices will go up or down. And this is a graph that shows the, uh, the price uh, at which people are willing to buy and sell shares. This is the market clearing price of shares in Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. And I updated this the, the day before I left. Uh, in, uh, I can't remember, uh, I left on the 11th and arrived, you lose a day, so I arrived here, I think it was October 3rd, I get confused. 
Um, but it, it, the, I, I, I've checked, the, the share prices are roughly the same now, and you can see that Barack Obama, his shares are trading, have been trading for about 60 cents, and Mitt Romney's shares are trading at about 40 cents. And, but you can also see that these numbers have moved around. There was a time back in September when Obama's popularity was in the high 30s, in which uh, his shares were trading at less than 50 percent, and then a time about uh, two months ago when his shares were trading at close to 70, 70 cents. And so this gives us an ability to give a conditional probabilistic estimate of what people with their own money, with their own skin in the game, who are informed what they think is likely to happen. Now, I actually think that the Obama shares are slightly overpriced. I would put, uh, if I were buying and selling them, I would probably not be willing to buy a share in Barack Obama, uh, Obama at much above 55%. So the obvious question would be for you to ask, well, if you're so smart, why don't you get in this market? Because if I think I know something in Moneyball fashion that other people don't, why don't I get, uh, uh, why don't I put my own money in this? Well, the answer is, despite the fact that the Iowa electronic market had to answer to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, I have my own regulatory institution to which I have to answer to, which is my wife. Uh, and I don't think she would be very thrilled if I said, hey, I just bet $500 <laughs> in a political marketplace. So I'm content to observe and snipe from the sidelines. If I'm right, it's on record that I'm right. If I'm wrong, who's going to remember? <laughs> the advantages of this market-based uh, model is that these actually tend to be much more accurate than, than most of the other models. Uh, now that you can, you can, we can quibble about the fact that the quantitative models actually are better able to make more precise estimates six months into the future, uh, but there are lots of things that, that can change and there's been a lot of research on these models that shows that these are actually uh, among the, the most accurate methods of, of thinking about what's going to happen. They are less volatile than the trial heats where you can see wild swings in the short term within a week or two, but they are still continually updating because the share prices are updated every day. And so as soon as something happens that can affect people's assessment of the probabilities, that will be reflected in the marketplace we know that the preferences are most likely to be sincere because of people are betting with their own money. And you're unlikely, there is some evidence that uh, people in the campaigns will try to get in and game and buy and sell, ser sell shares to each other at inflated or depressed prices, but there are enough people involved with this, uh, I mean several thousand typically, that having a few people trying to play games with this uh, is unlikely to succeed because you, you, you offer your share, you offer to sell shares at a particular price, you offer to buy them at a particular price, you have no control over who's going to buy your shares uh, or not, so you can't really engage in uh, what we, I guess we can call it stacked trading. Uh, we don't need to specify the model. People might be using a variety of different models. They might be just kind of using intuition. They might be using uh, 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 statistical models. So what do we do? Uh, I think the, the most interesting from both an academic and from a personal uh, perspective are the market-based models because uh, this is, I do this in my classes. Uh, I taught a class on the presidency uh, and you can also buy and sell shares in presidential primary candidates, pre-selection candidates. And if I wanted to talk to my students about what had happened in the previous week, I would bring up the, the chart of prices in the IEM, and I would be able to very clearly show, well, Romney, this happened, he won this primary, you can see a share prices uh, spike, uh, Santorum share prices went up and then dropped, and, and it's a very easy way to explain what can happen. So I, I like to use the market-based models, recognizing that they, they cannot incorporate specific events that happen because those are unpredictable, but it is possible, it, it is the fact that those future expectations about the probabilities of something happening that could affect the share price, people have taken that into account. Uh, this discounted information is already factored in and that the polls themselves are much more volatile and 
Uh, these continually updated crowdsourcing kind of uh, expectations are generally more intuitively plausible than even the, the, the most precise statistical method because there are some theoretical problems with that. So we know that there are lots of things that could easily change uh, the results, what happens in Iraq and Afghanistan in the next few months. Uh, Supreme Court decisions with respect to the Affordable Care Act, the court is likely to, to rule uh, in the next month or so. In the U.S., it's, it, it is universally illegal to bet on election outcomes. Uh, but I do have a bet with a colleague about what's likely to happen with the Supreme Court. Ten bucks in this country, ten bucks is a cup of coffee, so I figure it's no problem. The economy could go up, the economy could go down. Things in Greece and Europe, the euro, that could have a significant effect. There could be a scandal, although I know that never happens in Australia. Uh, the campaign, so here's the deal. We'll take him if we can give you back Rupert Murdoch. Is that a deal? Uh, no. Uh, normally, uh, it's safe to bet on the incumbent, but things, other things being equal is the way we express that. This time, other things are not equal. Uh, we have a very different set of circumstances uh, in which uh, that, that make 2012 a lot different than 2008. So in conclusion, this is what I tell my American audiences, which is that things change, uh, that they should pay attention, and that there will be a quiz in November. <laughs> so uh, I think of that, I'm happy to stop and be interested in taking your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Mayer. If anyone does have a question, I'd invite you to come to one of the microphones at uh, either side of the, the lecture theatre here. And um, we have a, a few minutes for questions to be asked. I, I think this crowd knows that, that it's been entertained um, and treated to a very interesting, stimulating 50 minutes. It left us lots of things to think about. But we have a question over on my right. Yes, uh, Professor Mayer. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, uh, could you give us some idea of the, of the practical consequences or financial consequences of making an accurate prediction? It's a very interesting parlour game, but could you tell us why people do it and what the likely consequences are? That, that's a very good question because uh, there are all sorts of conventional wisdoms about what a democratic or republican victory might mean for not just the economy in the long term, but shorter term uh, consequences for what is likely to happen in the stock market. So if you're making bets on the economy long term, it's difficult to make money off of that right away. But if you know with some confidence that the stock market is likely to go up or down, I mean, you can make quite a bit of money in a week. Uh, the, the difficulty is that uh, I really don't, I'm not aware of any models that can, uh, that can accurately predict what is going to happen based on a Democratic or Republican victory. I mean, you might think that, you know, if you're a business person, you might think that a Republican will be much better for the economy, a Democrat would be much worse, but it's actually much more complicated than that. There are lots and lots of intervening variables. So I, I think uh, the, the implications, particularly for Australia, are less economic in the short term, but more in terms of what a Obama re-election or an, a Romney election would mean for uh, U.S.-Australian relations or, or diplomacy. And there, uh, I, I suppose it might be a bit of a surprise, but I don't think there will be major changes in that regard. If uh, uh, I'm actually involved in some efforts now about trying to figure out why forecasting models have such a difficult time incorporating unexpected events. And uh, almost by definition, that's going to be very, very difficult, but there are ways to think about uh, the volatility of our forecasts based on unexpected events. But uh, if, if anybody has discovered a way of making money in the stock market based on a Republican or Democratic victory, I'm not aware of that. And I would assume that, that the smart thing would be to keep it under your hat <laughs> and, and make your money and, and, and to be quiet about it. 
Got Thank it. you. That was very interesting. And I noticed your focus on these market models and so forth. One things that we normally read about in the press here, especially with op-ed pieces from America and Australia as well on the American political system, two things you didn't mention um, that we read about are things like uh, Mitt Romney's religion mm -hmm. and, and, of course, the, the race question with Obama. Will that be become an issue this time, whereas in four years ago it was you know, well, he's a nice guy, so we won't worry about it, sort of thing. So the, the advantage of the market-based models is that it's not necessary to make any assumptions about how those things will affect the outcome, because presumably the people who invest in these, are who, they've already incorporated that. Uh, my sense as an observer is that things like Romney's religion are not likely to be a significant factor in the election, for a couple of reasons. One, for the people who consider that a very important issue. There are, there are two groups in the U.S. who would think that important. One is conservative evangelical Christians who are overwhelmingly Republican. The other, is, and they, they uh, uh, are suspicious of Mormonism for theological reasons. The other group would be sort of your classic left of center liberals who would uh, be concerned about the conservatism of the Mormon religion and other characteristics of it from a social perspective, those are almost entirely likely to be democratic. And the, the major issue for Romney, which is also a vi an issue in 2008, was that the, the, uh, for conservative Republicans, they are going to be most important in the primaries because there they had other options for what they considered to be more conservative uh, candidates. And if you are a, uh, a conservative evangelical Republican, now you are faced with a decision between Mitt Romney, who you may not trust for a variety of reasons, or Barack Obama, who you know you don't like. And it seems to me that some of those people might choose to abstain, but I, I think it would only become significant if the election was so close in, in, in specific states that a swing of a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of votes would make a difference. The other factor is that for people for whom that would make the biggest difference, not all of them, but most of them live in states like Alabama, Tennessee, you know, conservative states that are very unlikely to go Democratic, or California, in which they're very like, or Republican, or in California, that they're very likely to uh, be democratic. So I, my, my sense is that it will, it will be a factor only if the election is so close. And again, on the issue of Obama's race, I mean, it, it's not novel anymore. Uh, and there are some people who uh, will say to pollsters that they won't vote for a candidate because of his or her race. You know, the actual numbers are probably a little higher than that because it's not a socially acceptable answer. But these are people who uh, would be unlikely to vote for Obama in any event, I suspect. Uh, or they're in states that would, where their, their votes are not going to be determinative. So it could make a difference, but I think it's, it's unlikely to be near the top of the issues that people are most concerned about. Uh, over to my left. So go yeah. ahead. Uh, do you think if Obama's support of gay marriage will have any will have a significant role in the election? And if so, do you think it will help or hinder his chances? Well, that, that's a that's another good question, and I know that 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 was an issue that had implications here because when Obama made his statement in support, it got a lot of attention in the United States, and it also had an effect here, where it became an issue where the Prime Minister was asked what her opinion is or, what is or was. Uh, and again, that's, that's similar to Romney's religion and Obama's race. There are, there are people for whom that is an important issue. Uh, but I would make the argument that if I know your stance on gay marriage, I would be able to predict with very high accuracy whether you're going to vote for Obama or not. Uh, and I, I think that there, there are some people where that's the most important issue, sort of a social version of gun control, which is absolutely determinative for some people. But I, I don't think that that's going to cause uh, a lot of cross pressure 
with, with one possible exception. The, the one group that might be cross-pressured would be conservative evangelical African Americans who might, uh, who would generally be extremely supportive of Barack Obama but would also be concerned about that. But I, I just, uh, it's hard for me to think of why someone who is otherwise a, a supporter of Barack Obama or an opponent would change their vote uh, based on his position on gay marriage. And again, the caveat is that if the election is razor close, then any one of 500 things could make a difference. It might make a difference whether it rains in a state, which can tend to you know, have the conventional wisdom as that can, that can marginally depress turnout. If, if we are at a point where a Florida, where uh, six million people vote and the margin is essentially a few hundred votes, then all kinds of things could make a difference. But I, I suspect that, uh, and again, with the benefit of hindsight, it might be possible to look at the exit polls that will tell us whether people used uh, same-sex marriage as one of their most important factors. Uh, but I, I would be very surprised if that happens. Uh, thanks. Um, in your uh, explanation of the market-based um, systems, you were talking about a share trading market-based uh, system. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on betting markets and how useful they are in uh, predicting elections. So the, the, the difference between betting markets and these market-based models is, first of all, in the United States, betting is illegal. Uh, but you know, if you're here or in Great Britain or outside the U.S., it's, uh, it's fair game. The, 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 and again, not being uh, uh, much of a gambler, I, I do lose 10 bucks a month at my neighborhood poker game, but that's sort of the extent of it. One of the differences is that betting usually involves odds making by the person who is laying, laying the odds. And so they make their expectation, and I know that the, and, and typically uh, the odds maker will adjust those odds based on how the bets are coming in. If one side is receiving a lot of money, they'll you know, change the odds a little bit to get money coming in on the other side. As opposed to, and so there's, there's a degree of cent centralization there, which makes them slightly different than uh, market-based models. Uh, and uh, the, the market-based is, is more of a pure market in which there is no centralized uh, record keeping. There's nobody taking a percentage. And so generally those two things will, will move together. Uh, but uh, often you will, uh, well, yeah, th I mean, they're, they're similar except for that one difference. And, and typically the odds that you would get would be uh, certainly, they would be correlated very strongly with changes in the odds would correlate with changes in the share prices in the Iowa model. So the, the question is Mitt Romney's running mate, and I, I imagine you can bet on that. We'll be curious to see what, uh, what those show. Uh, it, it, I, I think the, the vice president, the importance of the vice president to the ticket is often overemphasized. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, much of what we consider to be evidence of the importance actually comes from John F. Kennedy's selection of Lyndon Johnson. Kennedy was... Uh, a young northerner. He picked Johnson, uh, a southerner in a key state of Texas. Johnson had been around in the Senate for a long time. And so that, you know, geographic balance, ideological balance, age balance, 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 balance. But there's lots of evidence that that is no longer the case. When Bill Clinton was elected, he picked Al Gore, another southerner, as his running mate. Uh, and when uh, George Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, 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 ran in 1990, 1988, he picked Dan Quayle, who was really an unknown, and Dan Quayle's from Indiana, which is a reliable Republican state. Uh, and uh, the, I think the importance of the vice president, or the, the, the lack of importance comes from, if you look at 2008, when uh, John McCain picked Sarah Palin, and Sarah Palin was considered, you know, she was interesting for a while, but had a series of disastrous public appearances and interviews when, you know, sort of became clear that, that she was uh, having difficulty with the, with the pressure of national politics. Even 
all of, counting all of that, McCain was actually leading in most polls until the financial meltdown occurred in October of 2008. If that doesn't occur, he has a very good probability of winning. So I, I think it's, it's what, what, given all the uh, sort of the traditional balancing factors, what, what I think will drive uh, Romney's selection, which I, I suspect he will not make until August, you know, close to the convention, uh, will be someone conservative uh, to uh, address concerns that a lot of Republicans have that he's not conservative enough, but not, you know, not scary conservative. And so possibilities, uh, you know, Marco Rubio's name comes up, a senator from Florida who's, who's young, very conservative, Hispanic, uh, comes from a swing state Florida. That's a possibility. There, you know, people play the equivalent of watching the lineup of the old Soviet Politburo members on Red Square and May Day Parade. And that, uh, Rubio made some comment at a, at a sort of otherwise unremarkable un presser when he said, well, when I'm the nominee, and tee -hee 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 -hee, you know, was he playing games or was it a real, mis who knows? That uh, another possibility would be uh, maybe Rob Portman, senator from Ohio, who I didn't know this, but he's actually Natalie Portman's father, I think. So although I, I suspect that that would not cause a mass exodus of the Hollywood folks from the Democrats to the Republicans. Uh, the, uh, people have mentioned Paul Ryan, who's a congressman from uh, Wisconsin, very, very smart, very ambitious, uh, economically conservative. You know, the, the problem with any of these names is that I can give you two reasons why they're likely, but I can also give you ten reasons why they're unlikely. So things may shake out, but I, I suspect the, uh, uh, the, the one thing I'm very confident is that uh, Romney will not pick a, uh, you know, will not pick a Northeast moderate Republican or people, I mean, there aren't that many, I don't think there are any Northeast moderate Republicans the way that there were two decades ago, but, but he's going to try to shore up his uh, connection with the base, but walk the tightrope that he doesn't want to do it in a way that, that will scare off voters, uh, uh, moderate voters in the general election. Time is up. I know there are more questions, but uh, we have to draw proceedings to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for a stimulating lecture, and I'd also like to make a prediction, and that is that in a couple of seconds the audience will join me in thanking you very much. Thank you. Thank you.